Glad to know you're still here with us on Kakaki, the African Voice, or we'll be looking at the national dailies now, particularly the stories that are captured on the front pages. And we do not do this alone. We do this with our reviewers who are already seated here with us at uh, the double, double, uh, what do we call them? Firebrand. Yeah, the double firebrand, <laughs> yes. Double All firebrand. right, so I'm talking about Alhaji Abdul Majid Dahiru and, of course, Dr. Austin Maho, both senior members of the PEM profession. It's a pleasure to have you both. Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, look at the papers. Uh, we start with the Nigerian pilot with its trademark uh, screaming headline in red. End of fuel scarcity soon. You have that story on page four. And the writers say, as Ipman Dangote reach agreement on direct supply of PMS, others. Ipman says agreement will ensure steady, affordable supply of PMS nationwide. Let's also go to the bottom of the page. Parliamentary system best for Nigeria, ex Oshun governor Aregbe Shola. What's that picture story about? It says fear queue in Abuja. In Abuja, yes. Really? Oh, okay. So let's go. The leadership newspaper. Experts seek regional front against Lakurawa. Ask federal government to adopt a multi-dimensional approach to threat. Want intelligence gathering, sharing strengthened. All right, other stories there. Okbebolo takes over as Edo governor today. Page 19, the details. The Nigerian News Direct leads with that story too. Edo Okbebolo to be sworn in today as Transition Committee probes 410 billion naira debt, recommends review of MOU for newly commissioned Stella Obasanjo Hospital. That story you will find on page three of the paper. Homegrown system of government will solve our ills. Ango Bugaje, others say, US presidential system has only bred poverty, insecurity, and corruption in Nigeria. How? You may want to find details on page two of this Nigeria. Grid collapse linked to severe vandalism, says TCN. Page 15 has got details. Atiku to Tinobu focus more on poverty, economy than attacking opposition. The writer says, economy Nigeria has potential to rise as leader in Africa. Council, the story is on page four of the People's Daily this morning. And uh, on the front page of the paper still, demolition of FCT shanties must continue. Wike insists. The Daily Times, a wickedness, a pain, an exclusive preserve of Tinubu's government. And this is coming from Atiku, as he says, President's economic policies approach to governance killing Nigerians. Details you can find on page two of the Daily Times. NLC gives governors December 1 ultimatum for minimum wage payment. The Daily Asset is the next paper. 83 reps demand return to parliamentary system. American presidential model our first mistake. Ango Abdullahi borrowing foreign system only enslaves a people. Usman Bugaje, that's the top headline, the top story on the front page of the Daily Asset this uh, morning. And let's also look at that, that headline. Ipman Dangote reach agreement on direct product supply. Deal will ensure steady fuel supply nationwide. Let's see how the Daily Trust leads this morning. It begins with Saudi summit and it says Tinubu, Prince Salman and others demand end to Israel's aggression in Gaza, call for two-state solution. Death toll in Palestine surpasses 43,000. Okay, you have to check all the details there. Dangote, Ipman agree on direct fuel supply. He's also making the paper. Yeah, one of the things I find frightening about that headline there is that 16,765 children are among the victims in the Israeli-Gaza war. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, really, really disturbing. frightening, mm -hmm. very disturbing. Let's go to the Guardian newspaper now, colorful front page as usual. Healthcare on life support as hospitals buckle under power crisis. Up to 20% fee increase as energy costs strain budgets. Staff resort to phone flashlights amid surgery delays, disrupted clinic schedules. Hospitals seek prioritization by electricity distributors due to life-saving services. And you see details in pictures and, of course, in uh, some uh, 
some print the hospital spend about 60 million monthly on diesel transfer costs transfer costs to patients and so many headlines on the front page of the uh, guardian all right the nigerian tribune outage uch needs urgent help juhe su chairman tells federal government protest rocks hospital over persistent power failure page 27 captures the details of that story and then the bold one ipman dangote reach agreement on direct lifting of petrol diesel others page six has details and from the 75 year old tribune newspaper we go on to the new telegraph professor ango abdullahi nigeria expired 10 years ago needs renegotiation reformation the story you will find on pages two three and four it says 1914 amalgamation edict meant to last 100 years 83 reps seek change from presidential to parliamentary government dogara bugaje back proposal that's the top headline on the front page of the new telegraph nmpc ends petroleum products import ramps up patronage of dangote refinery that's how this day reports that story and says new 20 billion dollars facility strikes deal with oil marketers for direct petrol purchase other stories above the mastered tinubu israel must end gaza aggression six two state solution at riyadh summit let's look at the business day FX receipts at risk as PSC JV production drops 35%. PIA unfinished business lingers. That's how the business day leads this morning. And of course, also on the front page, marketers agree to lift petrol from Dangote refinery, promise affordable regular PMS supply. That is another of the stories there. Okay, that's the last paper we're bringing this morning. So, gentlemen, let's uh, weigh in on the stories. And uh, the one that I think resonates with everyone is the fact that fuel scarcity will end soon. And this is coming from Ipman as Dangote Rich Agreement on Direct protect, uh, Product Supply uh, for, with if, if, Ipman. I don't know whether this is sharing news for us, really. Should be. Shouldn't it? Alhaj. This is a private enterprise. It's a private business between uh, an association of petroleum dealers and the refinery. What is important to Nigerians is we want to have availability of petrol and at an affordable price. You know, these theatrics in the media between Dangote, marketers on one hand, regulators, is becoming nauseating, to say the least. The question that you ask is, if Dangote wanted to sell petrol, to marketers, why did it take him such a long time to have this arrangement with Ipman? Ipman is one of the largest retail outlets or retail uh, cartel in Nigeria. So one would have thought that since you are refining petrol in Nigeria now, Ipman should have been one of your uh, critical partners in distribution of uh, these products. So if you have now reached an agreement with Ipman to distribute products, so. So be it. It's not something to celebrate. It's not something to be cherry about. Yeah, but the fact that the NMPC is saying this is an end of oil importation, you know, all those issues of uh, landing cost and uh, whatever cost that they used to tell us that it hikes the price of petrol, do you think it's going to have any effect? There is, no, there is no effect because, one, you cannot put an end to importation of petroleum, as we speak. Dangote is just one refinery. Part of the reason why you have scarcity in recent terms is that Dangote had pledged to supply the market through NMPC 25 million liters per day, beginning from September. It fell short of that target by almost, in some cases, 10 to 15 million liters per day. So that's a shortfall from the Dangote refinery. And the petrol that Nigeria has been consuming or been utilizing since September till this morning is from Dangote refineries. But that's a shortfall in supply from Dangote's refinery. They are not meeting up to the 25 million liters they pledged to turn out into the market. And that was why the NMDPRA, to solve this problem, had to issue import license from November to marketers who are willing to import to meet the availability side of our energy needs. And in the deregulated market, 
you cannot tie the fate, the energy security fate of, a, of, of an entire country of 200 million people to one refinery. It is dangerous. It's akin to monopoly. I say this because you must keep all supply chains for energy open because supply must always exceed demand at all times. Whenever you have a shortfall in supply and it is less than demand, it's a problem. Price will go up. You see scarcity. You see chaos everywhere. You begin to see price gouging. So it is healthy for both importers and refiners, local refiners, to compete in the market because there's no subsidy anymore. There's no advantage whether you're refining locally or not. What is important to you and I as end users is fair pricing. And the only way to guarantee fair pricing is competition. And Nigeria is not the only country that imports petrol, even while it has refineries at home. I cannot emphasize this enough. Saudi Arabia has five refineries at home. Saudi is a major exporter of refined petrol. Saudi exports as much as $45 billion worth of petrol annually. Saudi is also an importer of petrol. Because of the dynamics of availability. So if you're producing at home, you're also importing to augment what you're producing. So that at all times you have reserves ready. If, for instance, your refineries go, go back for whatever reason, all your five refineries pack up, you already have a supply chain that is open that will supply you throughout the period you're going to have fix your own local uh, capabilities. America has 132 refineries, 132 functional refineries as at this money. America exports over 10 million barrels of refined products. It's a major exporter of refined products. America also imports over 8 million barrels of refined products. Russia, the same thing. India, do your research. There's no major oil refining country that does not also import refined products. So Nigeria cannot rely on one refinery for its energy need. It's not possible. That good also is, is located in a free trade zone. So that good trade does not have an obligation under the PIA, any other law, to offload all of its products into the Nigerian market, for instance. So if that good trade often tells you that he has got a better offer for his product in, say, Ghana or Togo, and he's going to supply his clients there. So what do you do with the Nigerian market? Mm. Hmm. Food for thought. <laughs> food for thought, indeed. <laughs> Dr. Maho, your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, food, food for thought. You know, like uh, Moji said, you know, when it comes to petroleum products in Nigeria and its supply, two things to me are paramount, like he said. Pricing, affordability, and availability. Affordability and av availability. And when you look at this whole arrangement between Dan Gute and Ipman, the question is who benefits? Is it you, is it me? Or is it the capitalist entity that has taken over the country? When you want to understand Nigeria's problem, you look at who benefits. Who is benefiting from this arrangement? Is it me? Is it you? Does Dan Gote uh, taking over what I'll call the sole monopoly of supply of refined petroleum products to the Nigerian market, who does it really benefit? I think that's what we should focus on. And at the end of the day, with this arrangement, Dan Gote, right from time, all his, uh, <clears throat> all his cries, taking his blackmail to blackmail of Nigerians to the media, it was to achieve one thing, which he has finally, as I from this arena, achieved. That is to become the sole monopoly that supplies refined petroleum products to the Nigerian market. We as a media should focus on pricing. And I don't think our major problem is availability. It is pricing. I drove to the studio this morning, the roads are practically empty because many Nigerians cannot afford pricing of fuel at 1,113 naira. It's, 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 pro it's prohibitive, it's unaffordable, it, 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 it will strangulate the economy. And we should equally interrogate, I don't want to say it's Dangote fuel that is in the market, the kind of fuel we, are, we have in the market today. You buy fuel of 50 liters, on a Monday morning, before Thursday, you are raising funds again to buy fuel because the fuel burns at a rate that you begin to ask yourself, the, the quantity I bought, did it really reflect Dr. Maho, in, that, that, in that the, takes in, me in back. the quantity that is in the car? Dr. Maho, because it was never like this. Let me interrupt you mm -hmm. because this mm -hmm. takes us back to a time in this country where there were two grades of petrol. Mm -hmm at fuel stations. Mm. 
in the early 70s growing mm. up, even up yes. to the 80s, mm. you could drive into a fuel station and buy Premium. either ordinary or super. Ordinary or super. Or super. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was your choice. Mm -hmm. Super was more expensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the ordinary, quality was better, quality was better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you had a choice. Mm -hmm. But today, mm -hmm. where is that choice? Where is the quality? And that is where the danger, like Mojid has thoroughly highlighted, the danger of handing over, handing over your energy security to one individual to supply your fuel need is, is dangerous. And I think the regulators should pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Look into it. There should be no sentiment. If we are deregulating, we should deregulate fully and allow other players to come in in order to have a competitive environment that benefits all Nigerians. Where the market forces can truly, yeah, yeah. truly play. And I, and I buy from who I want to buy from. But Dan Gote's, if you look at his antique since the coming on stream of his refinery, it was to take over the market, to be the sole supplier Mm. of refined product to Nigerians. So if and one of this the agreement, what mm. I see is that he's inching close to that if he's not already there. If, yeah, if NNPC mm -hmm. is saying in one of the papers yeah, that, that no they are no longer, they've ended the importation, importation of, uh, of petrol well. so and then yeah, we, they are ramping up support yes, for the Angote refinery. At the end of the day, today, as we speak, if that agreement takes effect, we are all at the mercy of a Dangote supplied product. Nothing is wrong with that in a, in, 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 you know, in a free market enterprise. Mm. But let's have truly a deregulated environment that allows for all players. But, should, but shouldn't, know, the supply, shouldn't the supply from a local refinery actually bring down the price? That's my point, really. The danger, because the issue of uh, we imported and the then we had to the pay the extra cost for the landing and all that the should be... Is arrangement. <laughs> because if an NPC truly stops importing, and then MDPR refused to issue further licenses for importation to other marketers. Mm. We're going to see a steep rise in the price of petrol because it is one man dictating the price. Irrespective of whether it is produced and uh, you know, refined here or not. There is a contention <coughs> between some marketers that says, look, the importation <coughs> of petrol is still cheaper than local refined petrol. And it is very possible. You see, even in the US, in the east coast of the United States of America, refined petrol in the east coast in America is more expensive than imported petrol into the east coast of America from Eastern Europe. These are the because it depends on the cost of production, it depends on the incentives you enjoy in that part of the world or that jurisdiction. For instance, Saudi Arabia produces a crude, a barrel of crude oil with less than five dollars per barrel. In Nigeria, it's between forty and sixty-five, depending on the cost of production, but it's not less than $40 per barrel to produce a barrel of crude in Nigeria. So automatically, a Saudi refinery will have an advantage in terms of cheaper crude supply. If the government decides to give discounted rate of crude to its own refineries, it can give as low as $10 per barrel to its refineries. Whereas under PIA, it has to buy crude oil at the equivalent international rate. So, Which is where the subsidy really is in Saudi Arabia. And it, that, that's my understanding of what you just said. Severally, you cannot remove subsidy from Energy One. You can't really, really deregulate an, enter, an, an energy market because of the primacy of energy in productivity or production. However, the languages of this world looked at the part of the region that favored them, which is the prospect of a monopoly. And they are not trying for the government now to re-regulate the market in their favor to really achieve that monopolistic ambition. And that's why, as Nigerians, as long as money is taking subsidy from us through the regulation, please, government, allow me to buy petrol from anywhere it is brought into the world, from the world, at a price that is competitive and fair. If the government goes ahead to lock us into a monopoly, that will be the greatest, that will be an anticlimax of the so of the so-called deregulation policy, and it will destroy whatever little gains that would have been achieved from the regulation. Because they don't have ordinarily, in absence of subsidy, allow Nigerians to at least enjoy competitive pricing among the contending forces to bring it down. But now, if you do this, you want to do, you would have the little gain that you have that you prided yourself in by deregulation would have been completely evaporated. And it would be unfair, and the consequences. The consequences in terms of economic disruption 
and social unrest to be so, be so there that government will regret this action. Because you know why? It would have been a hopeless situation. Hopeless. Hmm. That is, price of petrol is rising. There are no alternatives at all in the deregulated market. So government should desist from any attempt to re-regulate a deregulated market that society has been taken away for one individual to travel as a monopoly. Hmm. And the point is, uh, Mkali, hmm. is there anywhere in the world where a country have one sole supplier of its petroleum products? Not even <laughs> it, it uh, one, refi one, one refinery. Yeah, one as you mean there are even mm -hmm. three or four you know, local refineries. The, the, point, the point we are looking at is the industry has been deregulated. When you deregulate, you are inviting players to come in and supply product at a competitive price. As long as they meet the quality threshold yes. of the regulator. Mm. That is what matters. All right. But in a situation whereby you now assign uh, Dangote as the sole supplier of refined petroleum mm -hmm. product mm -hmm. to Ipman, although we've not seen the content of that agreement, of that agreement but so. what we'll see, what we'll hear, what we anticipate doesn't benefit the ordinary man on the street. I don't see how it benefits Nigeria. And that is why we should, I said, we should focus on, on in that. all of these, who benefits? Who benefits? All right, mm -hmm. questions, and we'll keep asking these questions yeah. uh, you we, know, going we, forward. We need to go on to something mm -hmm. else because mm -hmm. time is uh, fast okay, spent. Sense. Now, yeah. let's look at the headlines that appeared on the People's Daily and Daily Times front pages. Article to Tinobu, focus more on poverty, economy, than attacking opposition. Majid, what do you think? Okay, there are two sides to the story, really. Yes, I, I think that the presidency should maintain the level of decorum that we saw at the beginning of this administration. When uh, our friend and former colleague, uh, the former special advisor on uh, media and uh, communication, Ajuri Ngelali, you know, when Ajuri took over that position, he said, Look, I am not going to talk down on the media, I will talk down on the Nigerian people. We are going to talk with each other, we're going to speak to each other with respect and dignity. And for the while he was there, really, no matter how people criticize the government, I believe we only put out government own position without going to a fight at all with any of the people, either opposition or the media, or even like you that are criticizing the government. And we had some level of um, dignity around the communication from the presidency, which is supposed to be, because we are a presidency for all of Nigerians. But we've seen a shift in that since uh, our government took over. Uh, <laughs> you see, as a presidency, I think they should adopt a jury style. You may not like the person called a jury, but his style was presidential. The presidency is not supposed to get into a fight with the opposition in this manner, to the point of attacking the personality of opposition leaders. I say this because it is their job to criticize. So leave us. That's why they are the opposition. They are the opposition. They, they, you, are to, you have not really delivered on the core mandate of government, which is welfare and security. You have not. Nigeria is in its worst state ever, as we speak. And so you must take some of the criticism in your strike and work hard towards making a turnaround in the fortunes of Nigerians. But my worry with even the criticism of the opposition, which I stated here last week, is this. In criticizing the article, you and him actually ran on the same template, on the same promises. I would have thought that by now, one year, five months after, that we've seen the ravages of the twin policies of flotation of the Naira and the removal of subsidy under the guise of the regulation from petrol. That, that, that um, Atiku and other opportunities would have sat down by now and they have undergone some level of introspection and reflection to say, look, we were also wrong in pledging you know, or promising you know, or promoting these ideas, it is clear that it's no longer working. And I will just make reference to somebody like Erufai, who had championed subsidy removal for as long as I can remember, since his days in BP. He's championed privatization, subsidy removal, up until it happened. And Erufai came back one year later to say, look, the government has restored subsidy somewhat, and that it is a good thing because they did not see mm. that it will have this level of damage. And he said, look, when you try something and it's not working, don't be too proud to, to, you know, to, to reverse your steps and take it. Mm -hmm. It is commonsensical. But I think we should have consulted widely, sat down with economists and other thinkers to say, look, what are the alternatives to this same thing that I ran with that Mr. Tidibu has implemented and has gone wrong? 
There is no way you can do subsidy that will not cause problems because there are no good ways of doing bad things. Subsidy removal is an abdication of responsibility of government to provide energy security for citizens. There is no way you can do, there is no good way to do a very terrible thing such as this. So I think we should desist from saying he could have done it better. There's no way you can float a currency and it should not float a, a currency like Naira, it should not float to Zimbabwe. There is no way you can do it. So I thought that Chiku by now would have said, look, I haven't looked at all situations. This is my new position on this matter. And then I advised the press to say, look, we're all on this, on this. We're on the boat together. together. But I have seen the light on, on the road to Damascus. Okay. And so I think that rather than floating the Naira, it should be unfloated. And you should, uh, you know, do all you can to peg it at an appropriate rate that will not hurt an import-dependent economy that's also trying to industrialize, on one hand. Secondly, on the vexed issue of petroleum subsidy, until the article decides and comes up to say, I was wrong on subsidy removal, and with the benefit of insight, I would not have removed subsidy if I, know what I, if I knew what I know now. And that going forward, I think subsidy is an economic virtue and not the vice we demonized it to be. Until I think we criticize it to the book in this manner by saying, I now believe in subsidy on petrol. I won't take him seriously. Mm. Okay, uh, doctor, I don't know what you think because they say he who stays in glass house does not throw stones. Uh, sometimes, even when Atiku criticizes Tinubu, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem like it is even the policy. It looks like it's an attack on the president himself, and then uh, the president replies back, attacking him as well. So, uh, is that uh, or what you know political leaders should be doing, really? That's not what they should be doing. Like Mojit said, look, criticism should be objective. It should be focused. And then you it offer be, alternatives. It should be based on issues. It should be issue-based. And what Atiku has been doing over time is trying to uh, position himself as the main opposition voice in the polity, main principal opposition voice. Not even the party. <laughs> so, no, there's not <laughs> even the party. He doesn't speak through PDP. He mm. speaks as an individual. But as a, a lone voice in the camp the wilderness. of the wilderness or in the camp of the opposition. You know, and most of the views he has, if you ask me, is in tandem with what Nigerians actually feel in terms of poverty, hunger, the economy, state of security. Tinubu can't do better. If you look at the fundamentals of the Nigeria economy, it's, 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 it's sad, it is painful, it is hurting everybody. Nobody can say that he's not feeling it. You know, I was reading, I was going through some statistics over the weekend, and you find out that in a space of 50 years, the Naira moved from zero, the exchange rate, Naira and dollar, moved to about, the highest we had was about 350. In a space of 50 years, it's independent. Then within a space of one year, it moved from 350 to 1,735 at and the point. And it's still moving. And it's still moving. So if you look at the disruption in people's life in, in one year, it's, 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 there's nobody that can, there's no economy that can stomach it, that can stand it. And then landlords it, added as much as 500,000 to their you know, no house rent in, they, in they, just one year. And rent for inflation. Uh, yes. And that is one. Then you look at cost of, at, at, when I bought my first car in Abuja here, I was buying fuel, I think at about two naira 50 cover per liter of fuel. Then you move from two naira 50 cover. Hmm? In a space of about 25 years, it came to, let's say, approximately 180 naira. Then from then, a space of one year, from, let's say, approximately about 200 naira per liter, to 1,130 naira. The shock many Nigerians are going through is too much. In a way, many of us, we don't know it yet, we need counseling. Mental health issues. Psychotherapy. Mm. Yes, <laughs> to be able to deal with the shock. Many of us, we, we, just, we just go on like zombie, accepting the situation we find ourselves. But the shock Many people are going through, they need therapy to be able to cope with it. And then you're not allowed to shout even when you want you, to cry. You're who not are even you going to, to cry, cry to? You have a government that is not listening. They don't care. They move, they go ahead with their policy. And that is why the issue of a bio and anuga coming 
on air to, to attack in the individual. And when I hear the presidency at times saying, be patient, the president, the person of Mr. President go on saying that, be, 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 be patient, uh, reform is, is working. <laughs> Where is it working for? Do you really love? see an the end to this? Uh, because that's my worry. Um, <coughs> here, I think we're saying wickedness, pain, and exclusive preserve of the government. But the government mm. keeps telling us, like you're saying, mm. that it's just for a while that this pain will go away. How will do it, you see an how, end how to this it, pain? And how soon? How will it go away? Jonathan's time, people were buying cars, managing to build houses. There was a healthy middle class. Now that middle class has been wiped out. What you have in Nigeria today is the rich and the wretched. 99% of Nigerians have been thrown into the class of the wretched. Some of us who felt that we are in the middle class, we can't cope. We can't cope with the situation. Then, you know, we've talked about all this. This shock people are going through is something that needs, you know, people, you need a council of people to sit down and do a thesis on for, for a study. You buy a bag of rice for last year at about this time, maybe for 40,000 naira. Today it's over 100,000 naira. How do you cope? And you are talking about, you are debating a minimum wage of. January so, last year it, it was 25,000 naira. This year. And it's about 130,000 today for the good one. Okay. Then the very bad one is <coughs> in the neighborhood of 100,000. Right. People Do cannot cope. Dr. When Maho. you see people on the streets of Nigeria, they are more like zombies unaware of the environment because Maho, of the economy situation let, we find ourselves. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> we can talk about this all day. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to something else. And I'd like us to uh, talk about this story on the front page of um, this Nigeria and daily assets. 83 reps demand return to parliamentary system, saying that the American presidential model was the Nigeria's very first mistake. And uh, if I'm looking, I'm looking at the headline of another on another paper here at the Daily Sun, it says edict establishing Nigeria expired 10 years ago. That's according to Angu Abdullahi, who is the this same Northern of, Elders Forum if, chairman. If you ask me, when, when I look at Nigeria's problem, for <coughs> instance, I look at those that have been the helms of affairs of the country. You know, the results we are getting as Nigeria today is a reflection of those that have presided over the affairs of this country in the last 65 years. So these same people cannot come on air and start proffering solutions. We need a total break. And at times, you know, when we talk on this in, a, in, in, in the studio like this, we talk under the assumption of all things being equal. Nothing is equal in, Niger in the Nigerian system. Nothing is equal. Because the fundamental of the Nigerian state is wrong. And I don't believe that Nigerians... Well, isn't that what they're trying to address? <laughs> <laughs> These same people that brought us in. I it, is, it, is, it, is, it is about the people. It is about the leadership class that has presided over this country in the last 64 years. It's not about the system. Mm. It is about people. Well, it is you... about are we building a country? I've asked this question severally. Our, what are we building? Nigeria is not yet a nation. Not until, like we have always said, we come together and decide that we want to build a country. Mm -hmm. I had hoped that it would happen in my lifetime. I should live in a country that I'm proud, I'm proud of to be called in Nigeria and a country that is working. Please keep but that what, hope alive. But what, <laughs> that's why <laughs> Let's I, get I, I hope it would, it, it would have happened in my lifetime. It but will. A, a, a situation where you have leadership that are not don't have the mindedness to grow the country. It's all about talking. You, today you want parliamentary system of government. Today you want by uh, by uh, unicameral uni uni legislature. From by camera to, to you. These are not the problems of Nigeria. The problems of Nigeria is deeper than this. Can I ask you? It has to do. Can I ask you to hold on? Look at the smile on his face. He has a wry smile on his face. It has to do with the fundamental of agreeing. The one we talk about consensus. The leaders have to agree that, look, let's come together. Let's put our own individual desire, want, aside, mm. class, the whole concept of class suicide, mm. and agree that we want to build, we want to build a country. I, I had hope that a Tinubu presidency would have been able to do that, but mm. it's a lost hope. So, let's hear from, from a You see, in the current situation we are mm -hmm. as a country, 
parliamentary system will be like adding petrol, <laughs> diesel, kerosene, okay. and open and open, you know, gas flare into a burning fire. You know, in addition to having a failed government at all times, mm. as long as I can remember in this country, and an equally failed opposition, one of the major problems Nigerians or Nigeria is having is also failed intellectuals. Those who have platforms like this to come on air. They theorize on things that you should that you think that they should have known better. You've been in government. You know why governments in Nigeria have been failing. It has nothing to do with the system. But those operating the system, including you yourselves. Then you come on air and with this level of braggadocio, fanfare, and matters, we should return to parliamentary system. Nigeria practiced parliamentary system between 1960 and 1966. It failed so woefully, so badly, that we ran away from it till 1999. Every consular conference that was convoked in this country, the recommendation was presidential. We were run, it was as if we were, somebody was chasing us and we were running from it. Because indeed, it was a disaster. The strong men you hear of in the First Republic, let me start with the Sadan of Sokoto, Amadou Bello, strong man, was an ordinary member of the Northern Indian House of Assembly. A parliamentary system. The question is how did they emerge so powerful as a notable demagogue to the point that for those of us, for those of us, for those of Nigerians in the South, Ahmad Bello was seen as, as an authoritarian tyrant in the parliamentary system. How did that happen? How did the almighty Awolo emerge as a political colossus? It was through the same parliamentary system. And when he left his position as Premier of Western Region to go to the Federal House of Reps to become position leader. I can totally imagine even mm -hmm. a greater demagogue that mm -hmm. displaced mm -hmm. our law, mm -hmm. that connived con 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 with the prime minister mm -hmm. of Nigeria, the parliamentary system, to rig Western region <coughs> elections, which created Operation Wet here, one of the worst post election violence Nigeria would ever experience, which eventually led to the fall of the First Republic. It was all done under parliamentary system. That anything you see today happening happened was the foundation was laid in that parliamentary system. And somebody sits down today. That Nigeria has become even more divided than just Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa into Egba, Ekiti, Ijebu, Ou, and in the case of the North, you now have all the tribes in the North now asserting self determination. To the extent that for the first time in history, there's a clear division between Hausas and Fulanese. The question will be in delineating the new parliament, that we, that the new legislative arm of government that to produce the executive because the parliament will produce the prime minister. How many constituents are you going to have along this ethnic contribution we're having today? I can assure you that if you come to my own native people, for example, we will not have one constituency. No. We're going to have no less than 200 constituencies along the 200 class will be the land for this time. <laughs> so how are, you going to, how are you going to manage it? Okay. Yeah. A nation, the problem with Nigeria today is what's the problem with Nigeria at independence? lack of the building blocks of a true modern nation, which have ingredients such as democratic citizenship, secularism, right. national integration, <coughs> right, and social we, cohesion. We have it to takes leave a leader, let me emphasize this, uh. it takes a leader or a leadership, either through presidential system, parliamentary, or whatever, or military, or dictatorship, or monarchy. It takes a leadership that can rise above the petty sentiments of ethnicity and religion and treat the entire country as own constituency. Uh -huh. Enough to now deploy his patriotism or her patriotism mm. to develop Nigeria along the lines of modern nation building. Yes, right, Majid, it's not that that has enabled us, uh, that must work towards we are going to, right. and it's possible that a presidential system of government. Majid, we are going to have to leave it there this <laughs> morning. Right. We are completely out of time. Thank you very much uh, for coming on the program. Abdul Majid, uh, Abdul Majid Dahiru and Dr. Austin Maho, mm. thank you for your time. And of course, your views on the newspaper headlines this morning. Oh, always insightful. Do have a great day. Thank you. All right, we'll be going into our first conversation for today. And of course, we also had that issue on the papers this morning, talking about great collapses in the country. Uh, today, we'll be looking for solution to all of that, at least to boost businesses which are already dwindling. Now, we'll be looking at this through the eye of a former chairman of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NERC. That's Dr. Sam Amadi, who is also an associate professor of law and the director.